Good evening. Welcome. Welcome back to the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. I wish you could be here during the day. It has been spectacular. We're enjoying the that little short window of brilliant color outside that it's just unbelievable this year. And we are actually, our house is in a maple grove. If you've never been here, we, we live beside a beautiful cemetery. <laughs> you have to say beautiful, right? Otherwise it sounds creepy. But it is beautiful. It's on a, it's on a hill and it's, it's actually called the Maple Grove Cemetery because there are some massive like 200 year old maples dotting this, these few acres around here. And we were blessed to buy this property and have those giants already there. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course there are hundreds of other maples all around of all different sizes and the colors are spectacular. So it's a wonderful time to be in New England and uh, just to be out there feeling the crisp air uh, blowing through and the warnings of winter coming. So while well, we're excited to be in the shop, there's something about this time of year that gets me cranked up to, to just be better in the shop, be better about making things. And it's not like I have to try to force myself to be better. It's just, it feels good to be in the shop and it's great to be in a creative space. So I hope you find that same kind of joy and that's what I'm hoping you'll share with me here and take into your own world and turn it however it feels good to you. Now, uh, oh, by the way, if you like this content, please go ahead and um, sign up, subscribe. Doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't really mean anything other than you get notified when we post new videos and it helps us out. So also uh, like and share as you will. Um, I forgot to say my opening line. <laughs> okay, the, the camera lady is saying, don't need to. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> quite well. All right, thank you. She, she knows how to edit me, probably better than anyone. All right, so we're going to get started tonight again, uh, continuing a little twist on our clock project that we talked about last week. If you weren't here, I'll just show you very quickly. Um, this is a template that I showed last week that I made to inlay some, we actually inlaid some aluminum tubing. Uh, we did a practice run on this piece here, and these are the actual uh, aluminum inlays there. And then this is the top that is going to get completed. Now, if you were hoping to see this done, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I don't have time right now to finish this clock. I decided to show you a different clock. Um, I've got too much else on my plate at the moment, but it's all good. And I'm going to reveal that to you, and, and pretty soon you'll be able to see... Um, what, what else I'm doing that I think you might enjoy. But anyway, this is the way this clock would end up being. And I noticed whenever they show clocks, you know, when you go to buy a clock, they always have them for some reason at 10 after 10. <laughs> you ever notice that? <laughs> they all seem to be at 10 after 10. I don't know. Maybe that's the only time you can take a picture of a clock. <laughs> but anyhow, I think it's, it's agreed upon as being, somebody might have a theory for this. Does anyone have a theory? Is it like an uplifting time or that the hands are pointing up? Things I'll look it up for you. But uh, anyway, it's, that's the way it is. And um, I'm not going to finish this one, but I decided to, because this is kind of a large clock face, probably not the one that would be as commonly made. I wanted to show you a style that would probably fit a little more 
with the common clock and one that would be awesome to make as a gift. And you could take my approach and turn it however you feel inspired. Uh, you can change the size by different hands, whatever. But I think you'll find it's pretty, pretty interesting. So this is the very expensive clockworks that I picked up for this one. Rather than using these longer hands here, which, um, gosh, Bruce, I sent you that length and I forgot already how long they are. I think they're about eight inches long from the pivot point. Like that hole right there is the pivot point. So these are from that point, yeah, they're eight and a quarter. So you'd need just a 16 and a half inch span just to get to the dots and then more for your clock face. So that's kind of a big clock. So I didn't want to um, necessarily show you that one. <coughs> Instead, I picked up one that's not so stylized and traditional and a little more contemporary that could go in another way. And it's got these very straight hands that might be getting lost in front of my shirt, but they're just these black straight hands. That's the, um, the hour hand, no, the um, minute hand. Right, yeah, the minute hand. I was gonna say the second hand, no. Here's the second hand, it's very tiny. And then the, um, the hour hand is very similar. So it's kind of got that very square, you know, contemporary look. I think the plainer things are, the more contemporary they are. So if you want to make a lot of money making furniture, I think it's probably a better strategy to say, to make contemporary stuff and do everything like a box. And it'll be, you, you, then you charge big bucks for it and uh, you'll be set. You'll be probably, the hip way. You, you'll be very Good. bored, but yeah. In some ways, it is the hip way. So there's the hands. Now you notice I scribe a circle on my first template for my larger table. I was going to put the holes right in here, but I decided to make it on a new template. But what I did was I measured from that center point on this one out to the end. So this is going to scale much better for the more common clock. And if we go to the end, to the center, it's right at four and five eighths I've got. So that's still a good size clock face. At four and five eighths, we're at nine and a quarter across to our holes. So that's what I did here. I took some dividers and I went boom, four and five eighths and scribed right around. And I had already marked all my uh, divisions here. So I was going to use that, but decided, nah, I'll, I'll show you on a separate piece. I wanted to have a dedicated square template for this other clock. Let me get these out of here. All right. So then in the box, you have your hands, you have a couple washers and the nut that threads onto the shaft, which these come in all different lengths to fit through the clock face. And you got to think about that because um, how thick of material you're going to use and how much you need that per to protrude. And is, your, is this little mechanism box going to be fully embedded into your clock? Or is it going to stick out and be proud like that so your clock is going to be off the wall? I don't like to be off the wall. <laughs> it's like, just the beginning, folks. <laughs> you could tell that was coming, right? <laughs> you know, you know it's some people who are off the wall. Well, I like it to be on the wall, so I want my clock mechanism to be fully embedded. So that determines somewhat the thickness of my clock material, because I don't want that stem to be way out. And I actually can. I have to have some material in there. So, you know, you could buy your metal or whatever faces 
and have it stuck on there. But I'm going to use a wooden face. Now, rather than a fancy uh, veneered face, we're going to use solid wood for our clock. So it won't be as complicated to put this thing together. Um, and once we get our template, you're going to be so efficient, it's going to be scary. You're going to be the clock maniac if you get into this. <laughs> <laughs> I realize I can make a clock pretty fast now. Now, you're probably asking yourself, how much is that priceless looking mechanism? How much does that cost? Well, it's $6.99. <laughs> uh, it's on Amazon. And these mechanisms, it seems like they're almost all the same. Um, it's, it's a quartz. They're all imported, of course. And Gosh, I forgot to bring out the AA battery. Do you have any over there? I don't have that size out here. Sorry. All right. It's okay. I th I'm sure it'll work. I'm trying to think what else I have. Oh, I got one in that other clock. I could pull it out of there if I really wanted. But anyway, anyway um, we'll, we'll talk about embedding that in a little bit because we do want to recess this into the back of our clock. So... For $7.99, I mean $6.99, 7 bucks, you can get one of these. We, we put a link to the works that I have right here on Amazon. Um, I even saw a place where I think you could buy like 40 or 50 of these sets. Um, no, was, I think it was 30 for 45 bucks. 30. So they're dirt cheap to produce. They're making a good margin on the seven but still it's cheap to get a clock so um this is the one i'm going to use and i'll set this aside for right now we know the length we want to be four and five eighths from the center out to our point so i'm just we talked about that last week like how to lay that out so i'm just gonna talk about it for a second but what i did was i created a new template and this is it. So I felt like I wanted a, a little margin, a little more margin between the outside and the inlaid dots I'm going to inlay for the different marks for the hours. So um, let's see, how much did that end up being? I think I kind of eyeballed it. But yeah, it's about a little over an inch and a half. So. I made this um, 12 and a half. So this is a 12 and a half inch square. Now I thought about, oh, maybe I should cut it. I can make it octagonal. I can make my clock face, um, you could make it round, octagonal or whatever. But I thought, nah, I'm going to make it contemporary. <laughs> I'm going to make it square. The square doesn't get enough credit. You know? That's what a lot of you squares are saying right now. <laughs> no, we squares, we don't get enough props. So it's time to let the square shine a little bit. And we're going to feature the square. And I actually, you know what? I actually think the square form here is not bad because there's something about combining it with the circular shape of the dots which gives you some contrast and makes it almost more appealing the way it sets it off. So this, seriously, it could be a kind of hip-looking clock. You get it, the right piece of wood. What? <laughs> I'm the first. What a discovery. This is genius. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but the right. But no, it's it, you might feel like you're stopping short of what you could do. But I'm. I thought, hey, let's just start out. You start out square, okay? Then you can take it wherever you want. But uh, it'll be fun to play around with other shapes. So to build this clock the way I'm doing it, you'll need a 12 and a half inch square piece of material, and I discovered that to embed this mechanism, I need the material to be um, 
like 15 16 thick. So you could do it, I think you can do it with 5 8 thick because the body of this um, piece here, it measures uh, 9, I'm sorry, 11 16 So yeah, technically you could do it with a 7 8 would work as well. But you'd be coming, you know, just 3 16 from the surface. That would, that would still be fine, okay? So, but I would recommend 15 16 The piece I got, the camera lady's nodding, that's enough on the measurements. <laughs> oh, no, oh, thanks. No, I'm just thinking I want to bury that, and then the stem is not super long on this. Some of them have a longer stem, and others wouldn't be enough. So um, this one, the stem is uh, 7 16 so you'll see it'll, when we set it up, it'll protrude just right. So the material I'm using, I, I dug around. I thought, hey, what do I got? What do I got around here for wood? I didn't want to glue anything up, which means I need a pretty wide plank. Um, and I wanted it to be interesting. And I found I had a little stash of wormy chestnut. Check it out. Or vermi chestnut, as um, was it Frank Klaus who said that? <laughs> or was that I've Arnold not heard him before, so I'm not a good help. Vermi chestnut. So um, is you can see it's vermi because of all the holes. Um, now uh, I love chestnut. A chestnut. It's kind of sad the story of chestnut. Most of us don't remember chestnut trees. Because um, I've, I've read they were, they were prolific. They were everywhere. They were probably the greatest American tree that was around because like in, um, they said that when the, they, they started to die in like the early 1900s, I think it was 1904, they tracked that this blight came from East Asia, sort of like a virus. <laughs> but it wasn't, um, not a... A virus, but it is a type of uh, fungus which somehow got transported in trade and started to spread and kill the chestnut trees. At that time, the American chestnut trees, they estimate in the following few years up to the middle uh, 1900s, three to four billion chestnut trees died. And the American chestnut was supposedly, I, I wish I could have seen it, it grew fast, it was large, it threw great shade, and um, it also produced the, the chestnut. The actual material was straight grained, rot resistant, so you could use it for a lot, it was used a lot for fence posts, um, for building, because the grain was straight. It's not super heavy, it's, it's got a, a of medium density, um, great color, texture. So it was used in furniture. They used it on railroad ties. They used it to build barns. Um, you know, so, so a lot of the posts and beams. People loved it for log cabins because it was very weather resistant, especially the logs near the ground. And to boot, it produced a, a huge crop of these delicious chestnuts. You know, you could even roast them on an open fire every Christmas. But so the animals were heavily fed off these now, like almost like the, the acorns of the oak trees around here now. They really are dependent on that crop. But anyway, it's, it's sad because they're all, almost all gone. Now, some of them still exist. Like in the colder climates, like as you get up toward the border and into Canada, some are still there. Like they say in northern Michigan, there are, there are about three or 400 pretty good-sized chestnut trees. But they grew massive and straight. So anyway, when you get some wormy, that means it died from the blight. It died, and then um, when it was on the ground, the worms got into it. So the fungus kills the tree, but these bugs would get into it afterwards, and uh, those are not actually what killed it. So if you can get reclaimed t 
timber from post and beam construction or beams, it usually it won't have the bugs eaten. You'll have non-vermi chestnut. But this this is a nice plank. It was a big plank. It was a, like I had it. It was about 25, 6 inches long, and it was a little wider than, it was about 13 wide, and a little thicker, so it was perfect. And I said, I'm going to run this. The only problem I had this, with this one piece when I squared it up was there was a knot. It, it turned out after I squared it up, there was a black knot, like a really big one, like right where, right where I needed that dot for that center, and it was a little off center, so it was going to totally mess up the thing. So I actually drilled it out, and I put a round plug in there using the same material. So it's plugged. It will show up a little, but I just for the show in this, I wanted this to be uh, a good case. But the color of it, I wanted something that was warm looking. And I'm going to use the same uh, Wenge plugs like this, which are almost ebony-like when you get finish on them. So I wanted a nice contrast. And I feel like this is a cool, hip, warm, you know, contrasting four o'clock. And then we'll have our black hands, which will come around and point at the black buttons or inlaid dots. So that's the plan. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Tom, uh, Martin's curious uh, how chestnut compares to butternut. Are they similar? Um... Good question. The chestnut, I found out, is a member of the beech family. The butternut, I'm not sure. Uh, butternut is a lighter, it's a lighter wood. It's a little softer wood than chestnut. I know that for sure. Butternut is also called the white walnut. So the grain appearance is almost identical to walnut, the way the figure looks and the texture and the, the graininess, um, where chestnut has a little richer, different, it's a little more porous, and I don't know how to explain it. Um, but the figures is different from walnut. It's not as close. Butternut is actually closer to walnut. But so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, I can't tell you any more than that. Someone else maybe knows. How about you, technical? What of you sitting there and knows the answer to that? I don't know if butternut. See if butternut's in the same family as chestnut. Is chestnut a uh, hardwood, Tom? Yes. Yep. <coughs> hmm. Yes, it is. So anyway, um, so I made my template. I'm not going to go through this because we talked about it last week. Once I got my quadrant set and my circle made, I just stepped it off. And I just walked with my dividers with the points on there until I was hitting dead in the middle. And then I just walked all the way around and I made a nice mark and I drilled a 3 8 inch hole for the smaller dots because I'm going to use the collar like last week, the 3 8 collar to drill a quarter inch hole. And I found my quarter inch plug cutter. So I've got these cute little quarter inch dots that I'll put in there. And then I found... And then I've also drilled a 5 8 inch hole for the 5 8 collar. And we're going to plunge a half inch rod a bit to put our half inch plug. We're in business. All right, so I've got the chalk on the tapered end. And let's get started. We're going to make a clock. Let's see how fast. Does anybody get the time? <laughs> Sorry. Pretty bad. All right, it doesn't really matter where I set this up. I, I actually cut this the same size as this one, but I'm just going to, so I'm going to get it flush all the way around. Um, I could use this side, but it was a little more gnarly with knots, so I stayed away from that. So we've got it nice and flush. And you know me, I'm going to grab the pin nailer. The beautiful thing about vermi chestnut that's so greedy is... You will never see the pin nail hole. Now for this clock, you could also use a lighter, creamier wood like um, maple or, I don't know, yeah, uh, butternut would work nice too um, if you wanted to use the darker dots. So once you get darker with the wood, you're going to want a lighter dot to set it off. I was wondering if this might be too close, but we'll see. All right, so there we go. 
we're in there. Now we need to set our router. We've already got our half inch bit in there. And I'm going to bring it up. I'll just drop it. Let me get it set up here. So I'll get this in position in the 5 8 hole. Okay. Now I'm going to plunge till I hit the wood. There we are. I'm just setting the depth accurately. And so I just want to take it out. Now I'm locked in at this position. Now I'm going to take one of my buttons. I want to set these so they're almost all the way in, just barely, so I don't have a, a lot to clean off. And these are about 3 16 thick right now. All I did was I had some Wenge this thickness and used the plug cutter to get this. These are my half. So here we go. I'm going to just see right here. This is the depth stop. So I'm going to turn this down and squeeze that right in there. And then I'm going to lock it. And I can take it out. I think. Stuck in there. <laughs> take it out just like that. Really smooth. Okay. Oh, stay, stay with me here. Now, I'm, I'm, so I'm tight there. I've got that in there. That's pretty snug. But I want it to be just, a I want to make sure that it's not going to protrude. So I'm going to just make this a tiny bit thinner. Uh, let's just go. There we go. And that way I know it'll be a, a little bit proud. All right. And I've already done that with the other one. This is going to be the 3 eighths. And this will plunge for the smaller dots. So watch how, see, once you've got your template made, we talked about this last time, you don't have to lay it out anymore. That's the beauty of this. You could just cut a bunch of squares. You've got your, your router plunge template. You just tack it to whatever you're doing or clamp it or double stick tape it if you don't want the holes, whatever. Um, and then just plunge away. You can go through and you can make several clocks pretty quickly. So I'm going to just show you. We'll go ahead and get this clamped down. I'm not, I'm not wearing my usual work shoes today. I usually have my clunky, heavy Carhartts on. But I've got my, my Reebok boating shoes <laughs> that my son gave me for Christmas who works at Reebok but so I feel light on my feet and I am fast <laughs> I am ready to move <laughs> all right here we go um where am I oh yeah here's my glasses I just can't find anything okay so I'm going to just go through this here's my my other guy here I'm ready to plunge so I'm going to get my gear on, and I'm just going to plunge all these holes. Here we go. I don't even really need to clamp this because it's not going anywhere.
All right. That's it. That was easy, huh? I'm going to pop this off. Tom, in your reading about chestnut, did you see any efforts to repopulate them? Oh, yeah. Oh, I meant to say that. Yeah. There is a, um, there's some promising, very promising uh, work going on now. It's been going on for about a decade, I think. And they found there is a tree in China that is very blight resistant. So they're using some type of the, the, um, I just snipped that. I didn't mean to. They're using um, like that genetic method to um, uh, cross. What, what am I trying to say? Cross breed. Cross pollinate. Sort of. Cross. Yeah. So anyway, they're they're finding they're getting more and more. They're getting close to the blight resistant. So who knows? Maybe in our lifetime. We could have those chestnut trees. There, is, there are lots of chestnut around still growing. I actually have one right outside the shop that we noticed a couple years ago. And it grows. It gets so big. You know, it's about that big around. And then it dies again. And it keeps coming up. And that, that fungus is still present. And so the trees are all still around. Like, they're still trying to grow wherever they are, so. Hey, could you do the same job you just did with a fixed base router? Uh, it's a little hard. It's, you really need a plunge. Maybe somebody's got an idea on that, but um, no, I think you really need a plunge router for this, because otherwise you'd be trying to fit the fixed base router in and You'd be plunging through your template. It'd be kind of messy. You've got to make sure you're seated in there properly before you plunge. So, I don't know. That'd be hard. Now, did you see what just happened? I was talking, and I didn't remove that, that um, little pin nail very well. So, I snipped it off, and then I got it flush. The beauty of this is I'm just going to sink that with a, a nail set. All right? Now, can you see which hole it is? <laughs> no, it's, but it actually is right in here somewhere. So, I mean, you could make another hole here and it wouldn't hurt at all. But, uh, so I'm not going to worry about that. But now... Do you have a preference on the, of the DeWalt um, or Festool router? Um, they're both great. I started, I had the, um, the DeWalt first, and this, I used to have the Elu before DeWalt bought them, and they kept the same, this is a great router, the DW625. Or W. They used to say W in uh, North Carolina, right? Anyway, um, I'm just, Getting this little nub out that from the plunge bit doesn't quite go all the way to the center. So that's just a quick little fix. This is the one where I have my plug. And let's see. Um, I'll have you read the chat later so you can see some of the findings there about uh, chestnut and walnut being in the same family. If I Oh, are they? That. Are they or not? Just reading it through. Oh, okay. That's okay. I know you're multitasking, as usual. I'm just going to break these nubs. And... You said the chestnuts in the beach family. Yep. I don't know about... Oh, uh, sorry. Butternut is in the white walnut. It's called white walnut. Butter and yeah. white, uh, butternut and walnut are in the same family, I believe. Right. Sorry. My fault. All right, so, I mean, beech is such a hard wood and a beautiful, a slow-growing, beautiful tree. We have some beech in the yard, too, and I love them, but they're kind of, they grow and they are majestic, big trees, but they're so slow. The beech are the ones that people would always carve their initials in because it has that smooth bark, but um, 
Well, I'm not sure what the bark is like on a chestnut, but they grew, they were noted for growing very fast and large. So that's why it was considered almost the perfect tree for all the attributes. But um, Yes, Reggie, we're losing a lot of our ash on our property. Yeah. yeah. Yep, the emerald ash borer is getting them. All right, so now I'm going to just glue these in. These go in hard enough where it's almost like you could, you didn't even need glue for this, but I like to put a little glue in there, keep them in. And it goes pretty fast, so I'm going to just use the Type Bond 3 here. This has a nice open time, and... We can get them all in there pretty quickly. Um, so let's see. Um, I have a little stick here. If you want to smear it around the walls a little better, just go around really quick. We're going to sand the face so I don't worry about too much glue being on the face, but I don't want to make a mess either. It's got kind of a lot of glue. see get rid of some of that glue some comments here about old trees folks remember in their yards oh yeah chestnuts and, and then the elms those also died off but the chestnuts and the elms were were known to be like such an integral part of early america with the streets and the shade trees and lining the streets and even in the cities um you know some of you probably have some memories i don't i forget when the elm went out but that was another great one so here i'm remembering to put the chalk side down and it's great they're just a little proud and same thing here And you could adjust the grain. I'm, I'm just putting the grain the same direction as, but they look so dark, it doesn't really show that much, but if there is any movement, they'll move the same, but you could, I don't think it matters with these as small as they are. There's my little cordage. These are cute little guys. Got germ disease in the 1960s and 70s. Oh, that's, yeah, okay, that makes sense because I remember my, when I was growing up in the city, in, in Lowell, all the trees, we had majestic big trees, and that's what I remember my grandmother telling me how they all died off, Dean's asking. and I was, I was there. Sorry. Go ahead. Why didn't you wrap the hole for, for movement? For movement? For these? Uh, these aren't going to move too much, Dean. Is that what you mean? I don't uh, know. I do, I, is that what you mean, Dean? I'm, I think that... These are so small. Uh, this is not a... These are going to... Because the grains go in the same direction, too, they're going to move. Any movement is minuscule over something small like this. And that would be the only argument to, to not, to um, against turning them so they're cross grain direction, but I think that would be so minuscule, it wouldn't. For the clock? Um, you route the hole for the movement, for the clock movement? Oh, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to, oh yeah, that's what you mean. I've got to do that after. I, this is going to find the center. I meant to mark the center before I took it off, but I can Good do question. that. question. Everybody's agreeing. Clock motor, clock movement. Yeah, right. Oh, the clock movement, yes. Yeah, I'm going to put that in. I'll show you in a minute. I wanted to get this in first. And... I do have a center hole, which I can easily reline and mark the center. But once I've got all these in, you could let it dry a little bit, but you can just come with a block plane 
and I can get them pretty level pretty quickly. I'm going to set a little fine there. Making me have a craving for cookies and cream ice cream. What? <laughs> this color? <laughs> that wood just looks... It is a warm... I love it. It's something about the chestnut. It feels like it'd be good in a... You know, a room where you could have leather chairs and smoke cigars. <laughs> That's Pass what you were thinking, time. right? I don't know. It just seems like a perfect worn. I've made some furniture over the years with chestnut. Um, one, you, I know I've mentioned this, but there's a little video three videos showing the barn bean bed and the barn beans were chestnut and I made this um, one of my favorite pieces ever was this uh, almost almost like a sleigh bed but made with chestnut and if you want to check that out it's kind of fun I'm gonna do something like that someday um, here and but we'll start, we'll start with clock faces. <coughs> now you look at that and you go, <laughs> where are the dots? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so many wormy holes. This probably would be better in non-wormy chestnut, but they will pop more when we get a little uh, finish. You'll see they, they go almost black. It made me think maybe black would be a better choice, like some type of ebony or something like that. If you got some thin ebony, you could make your plugs from that. But <laughs> now, let's go ahead and get our movement in there. So we're gonna center and that's good right there. And I've got a drill set up. I have a tiny little, it's like a 16th inch hole. I'm just gonna drill a tiny bit. It's bent because I just hit it on the door, but it's big enough. There it is, right in my center. So now the, the <laughs> it's this one. It's like looking in the sky for the North Star. It's that one. So this is the, uh, this stem is 5 sixteenths, uh, just a touch under. So a 5 sixteenths drill bit is perfect for drilling the center hole. So what I'm going to do is drill down through and then that center hole is going to reference and give us our index for where we're going to embed our mechanism from the back. We're going to know exactly where to place it. So let's head it over to the drill press and we'll do that now. All right. Got the... Uh, bit in there. I'm going to bring the point down to this to brad point bit and that that point actually helps center it. If you want to be accurate about that, it's easier to center it when it's off, I have found, than when it's on because sometimes it'll be slightly off the center. Now I can feel it's it's not moving at all. It's right in the center. So I can hold it still and move it. There, drill a nice quiet hole. See, all the way through. All right, so let's head back. See that there? I'm sure, you'll get lots of chance to look at it. All right, so we want to route. Here's our mechanism. We can put it right in there from the back. Okay, this is going to be the upright position. And um, I decided to leave that knot because I thought it'd be kind of cool and this will be just in this position right in the middle and recessed in there so how are we going to do that <laughs> you could just knife around it or pencil around it and then plunge out but no we're going to make a quick little template to plunge and get this fit in there nicely now it doesn't have to fit tight but we we want it pretty close so it looks clean 
but there'll be a slight margin around it so it'll fit in without binding. And um, we'll get that happening. So I'm going to set this aside actually for a second. All I need is the mechanism. I'll set my clock over here for a minute. And let's get, I got to change up a little bit here. Get some of this stuff out of the way. Let's see how fast those, those little inlay dots went. That's pretty quick when you get it set up after the first one. I mean, can't you see the, the pricey looking gifts you could be giving? This Christmas, that's a, not another great Christmas gift idea. All right, I'm going to bring up a piece of MDF because I'm going to want to plunge into this. All right, I'll get that in position. Okay. So here's what I want to make. This is a little window. If you look at what I've got here, I've got the, the mechanism or the movement, whatever. And you can see it's in there and there's actually quite a gracious margin around here. That's because the way I'm going to plunge route, I'm going to use the same setup right here that I just used. So I've got, actually, I've got my 5 8 inch collar and a half inch bit. So I've got a 16 inch offset margin there. So when that collar is guided by that hole, it actually is going to cut the same shape, 1 16 inch smaller all around, or 1 8 inch overall. And that explains some of that play right there. It's a little more than an eighth of an inch, actually, about a piece of a veneer, because that's what I'm going to use to make it. So let me show you how I make this. I'm going to, uh, I want to, I want to make a, a hole. Let's just take this. Now, for making this, you don't need this hole first, OK? So pretend that's not there. You can use just a straight piece of, uh, I'm using Baltic birch, quarter inch right here. So I want to make a hole approximately in the middle. It doesn't have to be dead center because we're going to use wherever it's placed to set this as our guide to plunge route. But we need to make a hole in here that's a 16th inch larger all around plus a little more, so that when I plunge with that offset, we'll get a closer margin. All right? Now, to do that, all I need are some little spacers. So what I've got here, I've got this is about an eighth of an inch. So this will get my margin for both sides. I just have to put it on one side. And here, if I just use it like that, and then I'm going to add a piece of veneer to give me a little more play or movement in there. I don't want it too tight. So I'll put a piece of veneer there and a piece of veneer there. And I want a hole basically this large. So I'm going to plunge route that, but I'm going to do it with a little different setup. So these are going to be my friends. These are going to actually um, create the walls to create the plunge to make this template, okay? I think it'll make sense if it's not yet as I go along. So I'm going to just set this here. Is that template 12 and a half inches also? No, it doesn't really matter how big the template is because this is, uh, doesn't have to be, I don't know if it is. It might be, if it is, it's not by design. No, it's a little less. And uh, the router bit, is it straight or an upcut bit? I'm using a straight, but you could use an upcut to be precise. Okay. Or a downcut, but an upcut works, yeah. So I'm just going to secure this in position here. Let's just, 
I don't want this moving right now. And now I'm going to uh, get this in position. So approximately here, let's just say, it's going to be right about in the middle here. I want this first one to be square to this edge so that I can align it. It doesn't have to be square when it's in the, when it's actually, sorry, let me not talk too much here. It doesn't have to be square on the template, but this will help me. I like it to be, look a little neater in the, from the back of the clock, and you'll see in a minute why. Okay, so that's going to be my first one. Then I need another one. I'm using this half inch MDF here. So if my clock is going to be right about here, my mechanism, I'll put this one here. And these are all square ends. So, all right, now I'm just going to box this in. So I'll do one more here and then one more coming in here. So that's going to give me my full surround. But I have to remember, before I put these on, I want to slip my spacers in there. That's going to make it the larger shape. So I'll get my veneer in. So the, the eighth inch is just making up the sixteenth on both sides. Okay. So with this in, in shape here, now I can tack these in. That's enough. <laughs> I think I'm running out. Huh? All right, so I can take my spacers out. And now I want a route here. So I want a router bit that will plunge in there and will make this template flush with these sidewalls here. And to do that, I have this little mortising. Um, it's like, it's great for. Uh, making jigs for putting in hinges, you know, like um, regular, what do you call those hinges? Butt hinges. So this bearing is going to ride on the MDF, and we're going to plunge, and it's a flush cut bearing. So that, it's very shallow, it's only a quarter inch high, so it's just right to do this, this material here. Um, oh, shoot. I meant to um, cut out the waist there, which I can do. I'll just pop this off for a second. All right, so to make this a little easier, I'm going to jigsaw out that center. So to do that, I'm going to first drill some holes for the jigsaw to access near the corner. This is where the MDF is handy because it can just drill into it underneath and not worry about drilling into your bench. Okay. All right. That's it. Now I'm going to grab the jigsaw and just cut out that waste. I'll just hit this over here. Okay, that's better. Now, did I, okay, all those are still in there. That's not a problem. I'll just re-tack it. Okay, so now we're ready. I just got to change this bit. We'll get the power off temporarily here. And... 
So we're going to change out to that bit. Do you know who makes that router bit? Do we have that to put? Oh, yeah, I meant to put a link. I think it's a Freud. Oh, Charlie's suggesting the orange is... CMT. Oh, CMT. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's CMT. My mistake. That's right, Charlie. You're on top of that. I can't fully read the number. You can look that up, though. It's... Um, I'm trying to think. It's not a mortising... Maybe it is. It's like a little... It's, it comes in really handy, though, for some flush cutting applications. We have the bit above the bare. Back. We back? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sorry, we lost you there for a minute. But I was just explaining that bit. I don't know if, how far we got in that. But it's, it's got a bearing above the straight cutter. And that now will ride again. So I can plunge till I hit the MDF now. i change my stop here. So when I hit, I'm still hitting here. Okay. There it is. So I'm hitting the table. And now I'm just, that bearing is going to ride on my nice little pattern I just made. And we'll make a clean cut. So let's go ahead and do we'll that. We'll try to find a link to that bit. Yeah. We're going to go a little over the usual, but it's worth it. All right, so here we go. Let's get that pried up here. All right, so see how it's it's flush with our blocks. So now I can pop these off. And there's our template. We're just going to pop this. Bob is saying that that's the bit that you used in the blanket chest um, project. Is that true? I might have used it for the hinges on the blanket chest. I can't remember if I used it there. Um, Thanks, Bob. I'll look on that list and perhaps the link will be If good. I did, I used it on just setting those hinges, like, because it was a, uh, I had used a different method prior to find that. There it is. There's our shape. Now, this, I realized that that mechanism was a little bit um, out of square. It was um, actually a little longer in one dimension. So anyway, I'll use, I'll use this one that I made a little earlier just to be sure. I know it's, I did that kind of fast, but I'm sure it's going to work. All right, so I've got to make sure all my pin nails are out of my table. Most of them anyway. So between the DeWalt and the Festool routers that you use, which is the easiest to reset for the next piece of the project? Um, well, the Festool has a little, some clever little ratcheting gadgets to it. 
it's probably the nicer. I don't know if it's as much horsepower, the one I have. Um, I like them both. So the Festool is a little lighter. It has a little nicer feature with the in some of the depth settings and things like that. So it is, you know, they are pricier, but you do get those added features, you know. So it's kind of like, but you can, you know, I, I enjoyed my DeWalt plenty fine until I had the Festool. So <laughs> you don't really need to buy the highest price to get great performance. I would, it's kind of like, what do you really need, you know? And do you want to spend the money? But uh, they're both good. All right, so um, now that I've got that set, I'm going to bring over my clock. And here's our front. And this is what I want it to be the bottom. So I'm going to set it down like this. And this will go in this position. So let's bring in our, our works. This is going to be the upright position. I'll put that there. Now I bring in my template. Now I've got that little margin there. So I've got some little spacers that I can. These are about a sixteenth, a little heavy. I put some tape on there. So by sticking these in there, they kind of um, center it, you know, allowing for that offset. And then I can just take my square which I hope is still set up. It's close. I'm just going to, I just want to tack this in so it's square to the bottom. So right there. Looks good right there. So now I can tack this in position. The stem is in my center hole. I've got the 16th inch strong border. And here we go. And now I can take this out, and I'm ready to route. Pretty quick, huh? So we'll hit that, clamp that down. Chuck says you're using the high precision shim tape. <laughs> the green tape. <laughs> I know. All right, and then. Inky ingenuity. Yeah, that's right. So now I'm going to use the same bit. This will take a little more. Now, if you wanted to speed this up in some way, if you were making a lot of them, I would actually ha have the drill press set up with a forstner bit on it, maybe a one inch or a three quarter, and plunge, like, drill most of the waste out. Because drilling is faster than routing, and it's not as much of a mess. But I don't have that set up right now. I'm just going to route it, just to show you. So. Let's go down, and then you would you would plunge route the final bit. You would just rough it out with a forstner a bit. So now I'm hitting the surface. Now I'm going to set the depth here. And for this, I want to um, want something like three quarters of an inch. Let's see where is. Oh, I had a piece of MDF here. Hang on a second. I'll be right back. Okay, here's a piece of three-quarter inch MDF. I'll just use, I'm bottomed out right now, so I'll adjust my stop. I'll bring it up. Let's turn it so you can see. Here's my stop again. And I'll bring that down on the MDF. That's going to give me my three-quarter plunge, and that will recess me just how much I want to go. Now I'll do it in a few steps. I'm going to have to vacuum it out and then we'll see how it fits. Let's go.
All right, let's test that fit. Now before I take the template off, I want to make sure that I've got it large enough. I didn't miss anything. And it's fitting in there nicely. Beautiful. And there's the stem out almost a quarter of an inch. That looks sweet. So I'm ready to take my template off. That was simple. But now I've got this template. So now with this recess template, now you're really in business. You only have to make that once or hopefully if you buy all the same mechanisms, I have a little different size for the longer one that I bought. Um, this is just slightly larger in one dimension. So I'm going to try not to snip this one off. They come out of the chestnut pretty easily. Sam's asking, how far do you go down on each pass? Oh, I was going, just for feel, um, close to a quarter of an inch. Um, you know, if you, it's kind of a sound thing. I'm listening to the router. I don't want to hear it overworking. Um, so, but it's, so it might be different in different harder woods, but this isn't too bad. So there we have it. Check that out. We've got our recess. Um, this is going to be the setup. Go in the back and then we would put our hands on and work it out. Now, um, before I, once I get that done, I would probably card scrape this. This has gone through my, my drum sander to 180. So I'd card scrape it and then orbital, I'd start with maybe 150. You could, if you wanted to, or 220 after that until it was nice and smooth. Then I'd also, I hit the edges hand planing and then I'd hit the end grain as well and sand everything and break these edges softly but leave that beautiful square shape, right? So the nice thing about this is that when the mechanism is in there, it's fully embedded. So I would recess like a keyhole hanger here. Um, you could use a metal one or there's other ways of hanging, of course. I had a keyhole thing, but I couldn't find it earlier, but I would just center it and hang it flat on the wall just put a screw in and but I don't want to leave you hanging here this is unfinished so hang with me no pun intended just a little longer let's put I, I made one earlier and it's ready for putting some finish on so let's do that and then we'll see what the mechanism looks like it'll just take a few minutes here got a question while you're finding that yeah uh, Stuart's asking, when routing inside, you go clockwise and outside the wood, it's counterclockwise, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, you're usually pulling a push against the uh, rotation of the cutter so that if you go with the rotation, you can do it if you're making a light cut, but if if it's a heavy cut, if you're going with the rotation, the router wants to jump and pull away from you. So, but when you're coming into the rotation, you have control. You're pulling it toward you, so it's, it's spinning into the cut. And um, you always want to think of spinning into the cut. Now, there are cases where going the other way, which is called a climb cut, technically, um, but you only want to do that if you're tr skimming a slight amount, like a sixteenth, maybe an eighth. An eighth is kind of heavy. An eighth is going to want to grab. So about a sixteenth of an inch you can climb cut if there's not much resistance. Because it's very difficult when that bit wants to catch and run. It's like it's getting traction. But when you're pulling into the spin, it's much easier to control, even if you're taking a heavy cut. So... All right, so let me set that over here. 
and check this one out. I made this one earlier, and look at how rustic this is. All right, so the other one had this crazy knot inclusion here. The other side had all these stains, which I didn't like, and I thought, why not? <laughs> no pun intended. Why not put some crazy knot in there? And you've got all this wild figure going on, too. So this is pretty radical and very contemporary. <laughs> so let's put a little finish on there. We've got our... Um, I'm going to just put some clear shellac because this is going to really... I don't want to yellow it out. It's got a beautiful color to it. And I don't want it to get too dark. Like um, the chestnut, if you... You can... It does react to dichromate, like potassium dichromate. It'll go very nice and warm and dark, but um, we'll talk about that another time. But I don't want to, this to go dark. I want to keep it as light as possible so that we get the nice contrast with our... Whoa. So it's kind of light, but it is a little bit of a golden wood. That looks sweet, huh? I have a question um, from Chuck. Is that a high torque mechanism? This is back when you were. Oh uh, no, Chuck! This because these hands are shorter, you don't need the high torque. So um, these didn't specify that it was a high torque mechanism. If it comes with hands of some length, they usually specify that it's a high torque mechanism. So. The other hands did come with one like that. All right. So I'm just brushing this on. You could spray this to speed it along. But wow, that knot looks cool, huh? Mm -hmm. That one dot does get kind of lost in there. But I don't think it's going to matter. It's going to look kind of cool. Um, normally, I wouldn't use a knot like that. But I wanted to finish use one. Use that as an excuse as to why you're late. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what time I'm sorry I'm late. I... This guy who made me this clock, he was such a slob. He just left this huge knot. Yeah, that would, that would work really well, that excuse. Uh, Ward's asking, is there enough clearance to get the battery cover off to replace the battery in the back? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Actually, yes. Uh, the battery comes straight out the back. It's not really a cover. Um, it snaps in straight from the back, so it's made to recess like that. So if I show you again, while we let that dry a second, um, the battery just pops right in from the back, so it's fully exposed. The battery is right here. It's a double A for this one. All right, so I should let this dry a little longer, but I can't wait. So let's get our little hands out. Um, I, I put on at least a couple coats of that. You could put an oil finish, but I'd rather go with shellac for this because um, the oils tend to darken the wood more because they saturate in, where this is a, the clear, or it has a very slight, very slight like amber tint to it. Um, now, Getting these hands also have a little plastic film on them. I've already taken it off, so you want to take that off before you attach them, and that protects the color of them. Now, to put it in, this one says you got to put the rubber washer on the stem first, and then this goes in from the back. So, let's check this out. That's what I had, yeah. Um, the big knot is at three o'clock in case you're wondering. All right, so that goes in from the back. And now I'll put on the brass washer on the front. And then you put the nut on. You thread this on. So see how I left a very slight clearance. You have to have enough to be able to thread this nut. And you don't need a lot because these hands will press on there. And uh, so I'd snug that up. Not too tight. I mean, none of this is too crazy, but there you go. Now we want to put our hands on. So let's do the classic 10 o'clock, 10 after. So I'll go right about there 
And you're going to press on the hour hand first. I'm not going to push too hard on that. And then the minute hand goes on. It's a little smaller. That goes on after. And then the second hand. Oops, my hour hand is bent. You got to make sure that they're up off the surface there. You can bend these, they're so light, and that they don't hit each other when they pass, obviously. So that's just a little adjustment. They're very delicate, but then the last one, let's put it right about here. And we're just going to, this goes right in the center. And there it is. All right, so check out that clock. Wow, uh, I, would, I would put the battery in and run it, but we're, sh we're very confident that's going to run. All right, so this is very rustic, but man, someone sees this and you say, do you realize that's one of the greatest trees of America? That tree built America. In some <laughs> ways, it did have a lot to do with it. So you've got like this tribute to the time when chestnut was king. Resting and, on an open fire. Yes. But you don't need to use chestnut. You could use curly maple, you could use maple, you could use uh, lots of lighter colored woods, or go dark and use metal and use, you know, uh, aluminum, like clean off the black. You just clean the black right off. I forget what I stripped that off with. It doesn't take much to take that black off if you want just the aluminum hands. They also make this one you'll find with white hands. So you could use that against a dark wood background. The sky's the limit. You don't even have to use solid wood. You can make a veneered front like we had with a sunburst or, or some type of square pattern. It's just up to you. I would love to see if some of you get into this and make them as Christmas gifts, you know, uh, where you go with it. Now you can also, you'll find that there's different hand sets you can get that have different sizes. So there's smaller, shorter hands. So you could even make smaller clocks than this. Um, offset them, do whatever you want. But I hope you enjoy that because these techniques, to make that template, you can see once you set up for certain works, you can blow this out pretty fast. You can put in your, your, uh, your dots for your hours and then plunge route your recess for your fitting there. And then, of course, you'd sign your name. And these would be big collector's items for your <laughs> clients <laughs> for years to come. So now I have more clock parts that I need to finish. <laughs> but I'm actually excited. I'm going to either finish that one out or how would you like this one in the house? Right where that octagonal one is, that store-bought. This would look much more natural. Yeah, it would be beautiful. So you start filling your house up with these warm pieces that have a story to them and, you know, some character. It's not like that thing you bought at Walmart for $7.99. <laughs> but Piece of you. Exactly. And it's, it's such a sweet, easy way to give a great gift as well. That's awesome. Any more questions? Uh, I think I got them all. Awesome. All right, well, we went a little over tonight, but we were having too much fun to stop any sooner. Hey, if you like this content, please subscribe and share and like and hit the bell to ring so you get notified when we have new comment, content coming up. Thank you so much on behalf of the camera lady and myself, Tom McLaughlin. I thank you for being here and spending some time in the shop in this beautiful fall day. And we look forward to seeing you next week right back here on Shop Night Live. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Always great to be with you guys and gals. Have a great week.